and welcome back. I'm going to talk today about rendering the figure. There's this, this is a two-part video. Part one is going to be the mechanics behind all of this. Part two will be breaking down the render. All right, so part one here we begin with what goes into what will be the rendering. What are all the different things that we need to think about here as we're doing that? And the first thing that we want to ground is some kind of sketch of the pose. We want to come up with something which I call the armature. This is what we hang everything on, the, the muscles, the bones, the tendons, uh, and then eventually the values, the light, um, etc. Um, so from the pose that we're working with over here off to the right, um, we then sketch out something of an armature and keep in mind all of the different mechanics that go into this. The first thing we want to think about is where is the camera in our reference because we have reference to work with. If we're sitting in a classroom with a model in front of us, where is our eye level to the model? Are they on a stand? Are they elevated above us? What are we seeing as far as perspective is concerned? Uh, the same thing with a photograph. We have to be a detective for a moment and determine how to see the photo so that we know where we are in space. And once we have that in mind, then we start building around that armature. We start building uh, the uh, torso and we start thinking about all of the different components that go into this armature so to speak so the torso is sort of a, a pillow shape if you will and the pillow shape is uh, broken up into two halves the upper half of the pillow shape uh, which is what I'm talking about around in here now um, is the representation of the rib cage in addition to the shoulders but I'm going to just talk about the core components for a moment here so the rib cage is up here and then we have the pelvis down below so let me take the armature and lighten that up just a little bit so we can kind of see the skeleton a little more and I'll bring the skeleton up to a, a full resolution here and so the armature is the rib cage above the pelvis below and there is a gap but this whole pillow shape is about the rib cage and then the dynamic against the, the uh, pelvis um, the arms and the legs are built in this armature to uh, pretty much average out the width of the bone structure between pertinent bones like for example in this three-quarter view the bottom of the ischium and the, uh, and the iliac crest or even the anterior superior iliac spine become the more important parts of the leg or the more forward and the, and the, fir the closest inward in the back and in the front just like the back of the both the humerus or, or the femur and the tibia back along in here and then in the front the patella and the tibia uh, those are the closest inward points to the skeletal structure uh, the same thing we do with the upper arm we look at the tuberosities of the humerus we look at the width of the wrist we look at something in the shoulder that helps guide us somewhere in this case we look at the outside edge between the deltoid and the tricep or the deltoid and the brachialis and then on the back we look at the armpit or in the front we look at the armpit we just kind of get an average there because the armpit tells us we're a lot closer to the rib cage here than we would be elsewhere so those two points kind of help us begin those lines the curvature of these lines I have denoted here called flexion and what flexion is in the arms and in the legs there's the flexion side and there's the extension side extension side is the back side extension side on the leg is the front side the flexion side is the front side of the arm or the back side of the leg and that basically means it's the direction that the arm and leg flex in and if we notice the flexing side of all of these limbs they have a slight curvature to them a concavity if you will in the bone structure and because of those curves those concave curves and because we're talking about the flexing limb uh, we're looking for this direction within the limb structure so the lines have flexion to them now going back up into the pillow <clears throat> just to solve the other two uh, problems that we have in this particular instance the lower 
points are harder to find because the figure is in perspective to us or the hips are at a distance to us rather than parallel to our eye. But typically, if we were looking at the body, we would be thinking ischium or greater trochanter and just sort of averaging it out from there. And if we can get all of those connected together across the body, that's what we would do. The top represents the acromion process and the acromion shelf around the shoulder, the furthest points out on the shoulder that are bone structure. That's the end of the skeletal structure before we get to the limbs. And so we're looking for those four points. And we look for those four points because those four corners give us more representation of twist, turn, and tilt than if we took those corners away. And I'm an advocate for any way of drawing, but for somebody who's learning anatomy, I want you to get connected with the anatomy right away. And while, yes, we are looking for the gesture of the pose, we are also looking for the solid structure of the pose. And these give us structural points to begin with. Once we feel pretty comfortable with that, we understand how to work with the figure, then we start letting things go and we can start advancing it towards things like a bean shape where there are no longer any corners, but we know how to handle the dynamics of the elliptical forms of the torso. And we can also put it in perspective and we can make it more dynamic than if we don't have points that we can reference right away. So the shapes that we're looking for here are, are very very skeletal driven. So the armature is the skeleton. If we think about what we're looking at here, the width of the line should follow the shallow in the arms and the legs or the closest edges to the bones. Thusly, these lines represent the skeleton. All right, so the skeleton is where we begin. Then we take it to another level and we put in the muscles. And the muscles are another stage that we get to. We learn where the skeleton is, then we learn where the muscles go on top of that. The muscles are the dynamic structure that moves the body. The skeleton is the foundation of the body. And if we think about this in terms of animation so that we get things to feel more uh, like there's tension within the body because there's always tension. We're fighting gravity all the time, so the body is constantly trying to defy gravity. And if we think of the skeleton as being gravity, the skeleton is always trying to get downward, while the muscles are always trying to reach upward. So that helps us kind of create a dynamic between the skeleton and the muscles. If we remember to do that when we draw our pictures, if we create that sort of tension between the two. When we take this away for just a moment and we take the skeleton away and we look at this, we have perspective lines around here. And this goes back to where the camera angle is. Once we know where our camera level is, our camera angle, then we can figure out the dynamic of the perspective. And how I think about this is in box form. But because we want to get to simplicity first, we start things off with a cylinder form. And then we can start thinking about front, side, front, side, back, inside, or anterior, front, posterior, back, lateral, outside, medial, inside. We look at those four angles because we will be actually squaring off the body. If you notice where these core shadows go, they create a hard edge much harder than a soft edge like a ball shape would have. And so we are thinking in terms of the back, the side, the front, and the inside. Plus, that's where the muscles are stacked up. But at first, we think about it in terms of what we have here, um, and that's these elliptical forms. And when we get to uh, drawing on these elliptical forms, when we draw an ellipse, we can then take that ellipse and we can find the four polar corners or the four centers, which then gives us an idea of where the four edges should go. And between those two concepts, we should be able to wall off our shapes and find where things go very specifically from the sides to the back to the inside, etc. And we'll know exactly how to get around that because we can see these forms now both in the block like space as well as the curvilinear like space. Going back to the armature, we have a few things to think about now. So in our armature, the design that we're looking at, um, we think about this pillow form 
as animated lines. Notice how each of these lines has quite a lot of curvature to them. And in those curved lines, there's an animated flare to them where they aren't just rigid lines going back and forth between the two uh, sides of the figure. They actually have motion to them. And so in this initial stage of building an armature, we are thinking about um, how we apply these lines. And the very first center line that we think about is more or less the direction that the body is bending in. So this might have a little bit more of an S-curve to it in the end, as mine does through here. But what I'm showing is the primary bend of the body. Once I know what that is, then I attach the neck, then I attach the base, and I get more of an articulation in the figure that has more to do with the skeletal structure. So the second wave of what I'm building then goes from a very graphic and flat design to a dimensional design. And one of the first places that I go to, I note up here, is the ellipse for the neck. Um, and in addition, all these other ellipses that I'm drawing around the figure are, have built three dimensions. One of the first places I go to is the neck because I want to make sure that the length of the neck is accurate to the figure. And then there's, of course, the wedges for the feet. That, and I need that right away because I'm looking for a perspective on the ground plane. How does this figure look in context to the surface that the figure is standing on? And that becomes a very critical thing where I look for this right angle and I look for this right angle. And if I can see those right angles working in context to one another in the same space, uh, and I know that things aren't going to get really wonky looking because I've found that the ground plane works. I've found that these two things can match a ground plane fairly well, or in this case, I've matched my reference well enough, then I can continue moving forward. But if I don't have this working, if I don't have the ground working right, then how am I going to know what the perspective is from that point upward? As well, if I don't take note of where that camera line is, then I'm not going to know the, uh, the information as well. If I don't know where this is, then I won't know how much I'm looking above and how much I'm looking below that camera line. So all of that then helps me come back to this information. And this information now changes things like the uh, line along the spine. That is now more articulated to the skeleton than it is to the action that the figure is taking. So with all of this information in mind and with this figure kind of like blocked out in rough, right? I'm thinking about these edges when I'm drawing the picture and how I articulate those edges so that I can make something of it. The next thing to do is to move on to the rendering. So when we draw a figure, of course we don't have all these colors. This is for you to be able to see what I'm seeing in terms of the musculature and how to break it down in part, right? But all of this information would be ghosted in into the picture space. And what we would really end up with is a very accurate or very keen line drawing that surrounds all of that information at whatever level or degree of realism to stylism we are looking for. So what this means now is that the animator can depart from the realist and can go their separate ways in terms of design style and in terms of rendering because if you're looking at things that are cell shaded or tune shaded you're not looking at three dimensions anymore. You're looking at the appearance of three dimensions but everything is still strictly broken down into notan or flat value relationships and we'll get into that term in the next chapter of this uh, two-part video. Um, but what we have right now is a dynamic armature with a dynamic skeleton and musculature sitting over the top of each other. And this is the information that we would, if we could not figure it out, we would block it in so that we could use it to help us make better decisions when we're blocking out the values and how we articulate this based upon its need, whether it is commercial or whether it is uh, fine art driven, which I still call commercial because if we're selling in a gallery, we're still making art in a commercial way. But one is more driven towards the single image experience while the other 
is for the masses, whatever that means, whether it's in print or it's in animated or what have you. Um, there's a distinct pathway we take and there's information we have to let go of unless you have an awesome crew of render artists that can work as fast as any production artist on an animation, which I doubt because everybody who renders takes their time because there's something about doing quality work that we need in terms of that rendering for us to justify the rendering in the first place in so many different ways psychologically. So um, different pathways. In the next video here, we're now gonna get into the shading part of it and talk about how we think about the light and how we think about the rendering of the forms. And that's based upon everything that you've just seen here. Future and it looks like lemonade. I've seen the future and it looks like lemonade. Mixing ocean of a potion, make you wish you'd never stayed.